Hi everyone, welcome to the last chapter for the workbook and um, all the solutions that you need for chapter 11. I am so glad that we have made it this far and you all, I'm hoping you're watching this before your major exam starts um, if you got the workbook and yeah, I will just say a few words at the end of this chapter if you want to linger on after I have shared all the solutions with you, but for now I will just get straight into it. So for the first question, I asked you to differentiate between self and non-self antigens. And this is pretty self-explanatory. Like a self antigen is an antigen that's produced by the body. So basically that's the antigen that your cells, your body knows belongs to you. And non-self antigens are foreign antigens that can stimulate an immune response. So the moment anything foreign enters your body and it looks a bit different on the outside, your body's like, nope, we've been invaded, we need to kill it. Um, why do autoimmune diseases occur? That's because the immune system recognizes the body's own antigens as foreign, which basically means that it's either the body is producing cells that are very similar to what would be considered foreign cells. So the antigens on those cells are maybe damaged or they look different from what the body recognizes as its own. So the immune system starts to attack that. Um, then I have a question here about how phagocytes respond to a non-self antigen. So how do they respond to a foreign antigen? And I asked you to mention the two groups of phagocytes. So first of all, just remember from chapter four, that is that phagocytes will engulf cells. So it's just like endocytosis. They engulf anything um, that they come across that is not supposed to be there. And there are two groups of these. Um, those are the neutrophils and the macrophages. So neutrophils will respond to foreign pathogens and neutrophils are very short lived. Um, if you want more detail on this chapter, please check out chapter 11. Go to playlist on the channel and just scroll down, find chapter 11 and you'll find all the videos on chapter 11 in the like as a playlist. So you can just listen to everything at once and it has a lot more detail. But always remember that neutrophils are short lived. They engulf the foreign cells and they tend to die. Um, like shortly after they combat an infection. Macrophages are not necessarily similar, like they don't they don't necessarily do the exact same thing, let me put it that way. So macrophages do engulf cells, but sometimes they also cut up the cells um, to trigger an immune response. So let's say, for example, a macrophage suspects that a cell has been infected, but that cell is sort of still masquerading and, you know, moving around and acting all like, oh, I'm part of the crew, a macrophage is quite violent. It can take that cell and just cut it up to reveal that it has antigens that are foreign inside of it. And the moment it reveals that the immune system is like, oh my God, these things are actually hidden here. And the immune system responds and obviously also memorizes um, what that antigen looks like in case it comes back. So macrophages go a little bit further than neutrophils and they tend to live longer as well. Um, then I gave you this graph and I asked you to describe the roles of the different types of immune cells in the primary in the primary response. So if you want to know a bit more detailed response around like what the primary response is, what the secondary response is, again, please check out the videos on chapter 11. All right. Um, so again, macrophages, we already know, they cut up the pathogens to display the antigens to the lymphocytes. And they also... Um, engulf some of the foreign particles depending on what it is um, then you have the b lymphocytes which are the ones that synthesize antibodies you have the helper t cells and the helper t cells are the ones that alert the immune system that there is a problem so they're like an alarm system within the body whenever a foreign particle invades they will send out um, all kinds of chemicals like such as histamines to say oh, there's something foreign entering the body and the body will then um, stimulate an immune response by releasing the killer T cells, which as the name says, they just kill whatever it is that is foreign. You have the B lymphocytes, which are the cells or the B plasma cells, as they might be called, which are the cells that make um, antibodies. And you also have the macrophages that come through. And then the overall effect is that because the body doesn't really know um, an initial, like when a when it's a primary response, the reason it's so-called is that the body is not familiar with this infection. It's not familiar with the, anti um, the antigen. So it takes a while for the immune response to work. Um, and you can see there, if you look at the graph, that the primary response takes, it has a bit of a lag time, right? You can see it's taking quite a bit of time before it starts to pick up. And then it reaches a low peak um, during which it would have like 
addressed the antigen and then stored the information about it. However, if after that primary response, there's what we call a secondary exposure, that means that um, the person is again exposed to the exact same antigen. This time around, the body will not take it slowly. The body already knows what this antigen looks like. It knows what kills it. It knows what the antigen is supposed to do or what it can do. So it immediately generates um, a quick immune response, which is the secondary response. And that's why the secondary response is quicker, because the body has a memory of the antigen. And here I ask you what cells play a key role in the secondary immune response. Those would be the memory T cells and the memory B cells. Um, so the memory T cells would be the cells that are like, wait, we've seen this before. We need to alert everybody. And once they do that alert system, then the B cells would say, oh, we have antibodies for that. Let's just release the antibodies. So the antibodies will then go and then grab onto the cells. And then that's the end of the cell's life because once the antibodies grab on, it's kind of difficult for the pathogen um, to survive. Now, that brings me to the question, what do antibodies actually do? And what do they look like? So antibodies are Y-shaped, and I deliberately didn't put anything here because I thought it would be a good idea to try to draw this. Um, but if you've been following my channel for a while, you know that drawing is not my strong suit, okay? but antibodies generally look like that. That looks like a two-headed beast that you might find in one of those movies, like, I don't know. Okay, I'm just going to close this up. That you might find in one of those movies, like those kind of like Game of Thrones vibe type of movies, but that's not what I'm trying to draw, I promise you. This is an antibody, and antibody is Y-shaped, okay? And what it has are these things called binding sites. And these binding sites are important because what they do is they bind to a pathogen. So people have the ill-informed um, idea that antibodies kill pathogens. No, they don't do that. They bind to the pathogen, and when they bind to it, they can prevent it from moving. And they, are, they can also draw attention to it, right? So it's like you being, like, it's like someone going into the mall. I'm not going to say you. Someone going into a shop for example, um, and they steal something and they, you know, try to like snake out. So they're sneaking through this very big shop, but someone else has seen them or maybe two people have seen them. And those two people are like, oh no, we need to stop that person from leaving the store. Now there may be like 50 people in the store and all 50 people don't know what's happening, but these two people know. So these two people go and they jump on the thief right? They just jump on the thief and they're like, we're holding you down here. Because of that ruckus that's created, because of that jumping on the thief and holding him down. Now more people are like, oh, what's happening over there? Then all of a sudden people know that, oh, this person was trying to steal. Then they call security and then security comes and takes the thief, um, takes the thief away. It's the exact same system with antibodies in the sense that they just grab onto the pathogen and draw attention to it, right? They, they, they draw attention to it. They stop it from moving. And for that reason, um, the the antibody, um, the pathogen rather, is subjected to an immune response and the immune cells come and they're like, oh, so you're the one who invaded us quietly. We're going to destroy you and they cut it up and do all of that. So that's what the binding sites are for. But that's not the only thing. Um, antibodies also have a quaternary structure and they are globular proteins. Now, I know it's a bit confusing when you say something is globular, but it has a Y shape. So the shape of the antibody itself is a whole different story from what the structure of the protein itself is. When we say it is globular, it means that it is similar to hemoglobin in the sense that it has all its hydrophobic um, amino acids on the inside and its hydrophilic ones on the outside. So that's related to its function because it needs to be able to move within the blood. And if it is hydrophobic, it can't do that. So that's very important um, for it to, to have. Um, it also has what we call a hinge region. And because I haven't drawn this well, then it doesn't look good, but the hinge region is somewhere here. Um, and that hinge region basically allows it to be flexible. So the, you know, if, if for example, it attaches to like a bacteria that's still wiggling away, the bacteria probably thinks, oh my goodness, I can probably shake this thing off, right? If I wiggle myself quickly enough. But that doesn't happen because the antibody is also very flexible. So if the bacteria is like, I'm dancing, the antibody is also like, I'm dancing along with you. Like we're dancing together until the end, until someone comes and grabs you. Um, so that's that's something else that, um, that they use. So they can attach to the flagella of bacteria. They can clump bacteria together in order to prevent their spread. And 
in some cases, and this might maybe punch a hole in my argument that they don't necessarily kill bacteria, there are some antibodies that can make holes in the cell walls of bacteria. Um, some of them can also coat bacteria so that phagocytes can recognize them. Um, and they can also render toxins harmless by secreting what they call antitoxins, or some of them are antitoxins. But in terms of structure, just take note of the binding site. Um, also take note of the globular structure and the fact that all the... Um, all the hydrophobic amino acids are on the inside and also take note of the hinge region. Then you also need to take note of the fact that the binding sites are referred to as variable regions. And that's because each binding site is different for each amino acid. So there are different antibodies for each antibody rather. There are different antibodies for different pathogens. So the binding site is what's different and the rest of the antibody stays the same. Then I asked you to differentiate between different types of immunity. So, I mean, that's pretty straightforward. Active immunity is the immunity that you get after you've been exposed to a pathogen and um, you have an infection, then your body just responds actively, basically. Um, natural immunity, again, is similar to active immunity in the sense that you can get it um, from interacting with your environment. That's your natural immunity. Um, you can get it from interacting with the environment. It doesn't necessarily require an immune response because as children, for example, you're exposed to like all kinds of bacteria all day, but they don't always all get you sick because your immune system just uses that to learn. Um, you also have passive immunity, which is the immunity that you gain without an immune response at all, but immunity that comes from not necessarily you interacting with anything per se, but like just getting it act passively, like you're, you're sleeping and immunity is coming to you like a baby. Um, and the example for that is a baby being fed by the mother through breast milk. And you can also have artificial immunity. And artificial immunity is the immunity that you gain from the introduction of like a vaccine or um, some, and I mean, we'll go into what a vaccine is in the next question, but it is basically what you get when you're introduced to like an attenuated pathogen. When we say attenuated, it means it has been weakened um or what you get when an antibody is injected into you to sort of like get your immune cells to learn what an antibody what the antibody should look like or when you get an antitoxin that's artificial immunity because it's being introduced into your body you're not making it then i have a question here about monoclonal antibodies i'm not going to go into detail about this because i'm pretty sure you know like this is just a process, like you inject it into a mouse, the mouse recognizes the antigen, it makes the B cells, the B cells make um, the antibodies, um, the B cells are fused with cancer cells rather to form hybridomas and blah, blah, blah. Um, this is what antibodies, monoclonal antibodies, that's how they are prepared. All right, and now for the last bit, what is a vaccine? And this can be quite difficult to define, but I imagine that now that COVID has happened, you're probably getting this question a lot in the exams. Um, so a vaccine is like a biological preparation um, of a live or attenuated microorganism or toxin, and it contains the antigens of the toxin. So when it's injected into the body, the body recognizes this as a toxin, stimulates a primary response, and from then on, whenever you're exposed to it, there's a secondary response that ensures that you don't get sick or you don't get sick as much. So some factors that might render vac um, vaccines ineffective are if there's a mutation in the virus. So let's say after you make the vaccine, the virus mutates, then you've got to make another vaccine because the virus has changed or the microorganism has changed. Doesn't always have to be a virus. Um, there are different variants of the same pathogen. Uh, so it means that like there are five different types and they all act differently. So, or they all have different attack points. So you would need to make different like vaccines to um, different vaccines to sort of cover all of them. And sometimes people have poor responses to vaccines. So vaccines are not always 100%, as you might have noticed with COVID. Um, some people respond poorly and they can have terrible side effects or they might just not be effective for them and they still get sick. How do vaccines help to reduce disease transmission? Obviously by vaccinating a large group of people. I'm sure COVID has taught you this, that the more people are um, vaccinated, at least in theory, um, it confers what we call herd immunity because then people have the immune response and the pathogen is no longer able to continue multiplying itself and become infectious that when, so that they can transmit it to other people. So it reduces transmission in that way. And that's what we call herd immunity when we, um, when we immunize a lot of people so that they are unable to pass on the vaccine. 
So that's it. Um, I am not going to be available on the channel as much anymore. I mean, I haven't been anyway, but I'm just saying this officially because um, I've become incredibly busy and I do think that the channel has provided value to a lot of people and I'm very happy for that. I'm very grateful for all the support that I've gotten from all of you. My life is just going really busy. I'm not actually a content creator um, for a living. I don't get a lot of money for the, from the channel, just by the way, in case anybody was thinking, oh, she makes a lot of money from this. I actually don't. Um, I make very little money from it, actually, uh, because for me to make a lot of money, people need to watch all the ads. And I mean, I'm pretty sure for a lot of you when you're studying, you don't really do that. But I mean, that's OK. I started the channel because I wanted to help my students at the time. And I know that the content on the channel will continue to be relevant for the A-level syllabus until the syllabus completely changes. As long as there is no complete change, the chapters are the same, the um, topics are the same, then you will still have all the relevant information that you need here. There might be some additions here and there that you might need to cover up with school. Uh, but again, just also a reminder that this channel was not designed to replace your school teacher. It was designed to help you revise. So after you've gone to school and you've learned the basics, you can come here and revise it, or you can use this as a preliminary before you even go to class. So you can come here, listen to the thing, go to class, understand a bit better, have a discussion with your teacher about concepts you don't understand, and then uh, be able to answer past questions. So I'm glad it's been able to do that. I enjoy receiving your comments about how well you're doing. Please continue to send them. They really make my day. Uh, but I will not be available on the channel um, as much, and I might not be making videos as much anymore. But I do wish you all good luck. I wish you good luck with the upcoming exams, and I hope that you continue to recommend the channel to your friends. Um, if I do start another channel, it might not be something A-level related, but I will, I will share it if, in case it's something that you're interested in, or you might find it. Who knows? Um, but yeah, thank you all so much, and I hope you continue to have an amazing time. All right then, goodbye.